This is the word of God that we're dealing with. Every letter of it is worth losing sleep over. We want to key our level of absolutism to what God has actually warranted, right? And so I am a resurrection absolutist. God gave us what we needed, so we want to, we want to know what he gave us. We don't need to be more orthodox than God. And Smith takes up that claim exactly. and says, we deny that. And we affirm and avow that the very meanest translation of our Bible in English is still the Word of God. You are listening to the Textual Confidence Collective. It's great to be back with you guys. Um, We had some nice carrots in between. And thank you very much to Tim and his lovely new wife for... That makes it sound like he had an old wife before. This is your (laughs) only wife. Thank you for... uh, He is newly married. Newly married. Newly married. And brought us these nice Textual Confidence Collective mugs which are not for sale. We've got the only ones in existence here. Uh, Thank you so much for that. In this episode, we're going to dive into, as we promised, the history of textual absolutism. We talked about that idea a bit in our first episode. But Tim, would you mind giving us a little refresher before we dive in? What is textual absolutism? Yeah, so we're broadly framing three positions on the text. These aren't methods of doing textual criticisms, but criticism, but they're positions on the reliability of the text of the New Testament. And we're sketching out broadly three views, textual absolutism, textual skepticism, and textual confidence. The right view, the third view. The right view. Yeah. The third view is always the right view. Right. So we've got the right view. Um, textual absolutism, that first one, broadly is someone who takes any particular form of the text and treats that form of the text as an absolute authority, whether a particular translation, particular manuscript, particular text. Uh, etc. So textual absolutism, if we conceive it broadly like that, then we can scan the range of church history and ask, has this showed up throughout church history? Where does it show up? How does it appear? Uh, What does it look like? How does it interact with the other views? And we're going to get into that long history. And actually, as you and I were uh, laying this episode out, I was a little surprised even when we were pulling all these examples together and you brought in some that I found really fascinating that I hadn't considered. And you'll have a chance to give those to our viewers slash listeners to this video podcast. So let's go right up to the long history of textual absolutism. It has a long history. It has a broad history. Um, Can I actually start with the example that um, I suggested? Um, I see textual absolutism in the very name of the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, that is pre-Christian. The Septuagint comes from the 70 or uh, alternately the 72, depending on what legend you're reading there. And although that name uh, was developed, I believe, before this legend, the legend has it of longstanding that the 72 translators of the Septuagint all went into separate rooms and all came out at the end of their six months or whatever of translating from Hebrew into Greek with identical translations. And you ask, why would they bother to have such a legend? It's because this is a perennial temptation to say that uh, either on the one hand to say your translation is totally corrupted and messed up, that's contextual skepticism, and that existed back then, or to say, no, we have an absolutely perfect one. The only way that you can have identical translations from 72 different people, given how complex translation is. And God made it this way, right? God made it so languages don't map perfectly and easily onto one another. It takes some toil. Uh, The only way you can have that is if the Holy Spirit nudges all those translators in the right direction. It's what the King James translators called an extraordinary measure of God's Spirit. And they specifically said they did not have this. So there's textual absolutism. That, Talk that, to us. Go ahead. Oh, so that story was narrated in the letter to Aristeas, right? Right. Who, yeah. yeah, and it, it's an ancient story, and it was yeah. widely, but widely believed uh, in you know it, throughout the history of Christianity that this you know even my people it was it was striking because you know Irenaeus when we get t- to talking about you know examples of doing textual scholarship in the Christian Church, Irenaeus talks about different you know the reading of different manuscripts of Revelation. So he's he's not a textual absolutist when it comes to the New Testament. But he assumes that this story of, you know, the 70 uh, is true because it yeah. was widely accepted. And, and that just struck me that you can you can have like this textual absolutist attitude in one area and maybe right. not in another area. Exactly. So you may not even think of yourself in that way. Right. Um, and yet your practice could still reflect something you may have picked up from the air, as it were, and whatever circles that you, you are in. 
Um, and in, so you, we have to be conscious. We have to actually analyze our practices. What beliefs are we presupposing by that? King James translators become increasingly godly, <clears throat> and they learned Hebrew and Greek at increasingly younger ages. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Justin Martyr, Psalm ninety six ten. Yeah. Good. Jim, so tell us the that attitude towards the LXX, of course, spreads Septuagint, the Septuagint. LXXs. Yes, uh, th the Septuagint spreads through early Christianity in different levels. Justin never quite goes so far as to say it's inspired, but he gets involved in this dialogue with Trypho, the Jew, and they have two separate forms of the text. Trypho's got a Hebrew text, and Justin has his Greek translation that he believes has divine authorization, and those texts have differences. And when they look at those differences, Justin accuses the Jewish scribes of having altered the text on purpose. He says, you guys, you guys are skeptics that have falsified the text. You've corrupted it. In fact, he uses the phrase, you've deleted passages. He says, you've deleted passages. And just to give one example, um, in Psalms 96.10, he prints his whole form of the text that he has. And it says the Lord reigns in the Hebrew text. And then there's an extra phrase, the Lord reigns from the tree. That's what Justin has. Well, that's a clear statement about the deity of Jesus. From the cross, God himself is reigning. Justin says, you've taken my text that has high Christology, high affirmation of the deity of Jesus, and you've deleted it. So he's got this textual absolutist framework that blinds him from ever even considering the possibility that that's a Christian interpolation. And even if you've got just a King James Bible and you open it, you'll realize that phrase isn't in there. The King James has the shorter form of the text, the less orthodox form of the text, the lower view of Jesus in that text. With air quotes. With air quotes, right. right from his perspective. Um, and that's just a natural temptation in absolutism to take my text and be very concerned about changes that downplay the deity of Jesus. But looking back, we can go, oh, even someone using the King James can see he was defending a wrong form of the text. Yeah, and I just want we just want to be you know just like you said we just want to want to be very clear we are not actually saying <laughs> that the reading found in the King James is less orthodox right but that the accusation you know that it, it that is what is accused right uh, and and so you know that accusation no matter how you know you make it from your perspective but you're you're still vulnerable to someone else making that accusation at you because you can always make the text more explicit you can always you know you can always add more but God right. gave us what we needed so we want to we want to know what He gave us. We don't need to be more orthodox than God. Right. Making the, the text, point. making the text more explicit is a, an observable scribal habit. Exactly. Yeah. Just right. so you know, yeah. we can get into that later. Yes. Which is why the TR arguments can work as well as they do, because typically the TR is longer and more explicit about, for example, you know, instead of saying he, it'll say Jesus. Yeah. And, and if anybody isn't already familiar with Facebook meme level arguments for King James onlyism. Um, <laughs> you just, you just cannot help but hear the same style of argument in that Justin Martyr story where the implication is omission equals denial. And the only reason this could be missing from your text is because you disbelieve it and you've corrupted that text, not even considering the possibility that somebody has added this. Textual absolutism, I also have seen, of course, in the Roman Catholic attitude toward the Latin Vulgate over time. And I would really like to write a paper on this, but I have definitely seen, I think I put some of this in authorized. Um, I have seen arguments from um, 14th century uh, Roman Catholic clergy who are reacting to uh, Wycliffe's you know, translation of the Bible, which is actually from the Vulgate, which is a problem in itself, but still it's better, it's in English. And, and I just cannot help but hear Facebook memes from today. It, they sound so similar. Tim, tell us a little bit more about textual absolutism regarding the Vulgate. Yeah, so the Vulgate comes along as a Jerome's, depending on who all did it, Jerome is the one credited with so much of it, uh, this revision of the old Latin text going back to um, the original languages. And it becomes kind of the standard text in the Western church for the next thousand years and attitudes towards it uh, just develop that natural tendency toward absolutism. This is my translation. Therefore, this is my Bible. Therefore, this is the form of the Bible that shouldn't be corrected. Um, that doesn't become codified as dogma until the Council of Trent in 1545. Uh, but we can see it pop up earlier. And one of the places that it pops up that's really interesting is in the critics who opposed Erasmus's work. Erasmus comes across a work by Lorenzo Valla in 1504 that has written annotations about the text. And he starts to do the same thing, right? Annotations about the text, places where Latin manuscripts differ, places where Latin manuscripts are different from Greek manuscripts. 
And then he decides, you know what? There's enough problems in the form of the Latin Vulgate that's out there today being published. Remember, the Latin Vulgate is the first thing to come off the printing press, right? It's being spread around. There's a bunch of different Bible editions. It's a Vulgate. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's uh, all over the place. And he says, I, I want to correct it. And he starts to write a revision of it and plans to write a revision of the Latin Vulgate. And before he's even done, that's what he publishes in 1516, his first text. But before he's even done, people are writing him saying, whoa. This is dangerous. Uh, Martin Van Dorp and him correspond a lot before his first edition comes out. And Dorp says, Erasmus, you don't know what you're about to get into. Bringing up textual variants is a threat to the authority of Scripture. We've got our inspired Vulgate. Now, again, inspired Vulgate is not dogma yet, but it's very, very widely held. He says, we have our inspired Vulgate. And if you start pointing out problems in that Vulgate, then people are going to not trust their Bible. Because if the Bible can be wrong in one point, then it can be wrong in every point. It's that same absolutist logic. So him and uh, Erasmus correspond back and forth that Erasmus utterly disagrees. Erasmus says, no, the, the Christian faith is not threatened by raising textual variants. In fact, let me read just a quote to you from one of his letters to Martin Dorp as he's responding to him. He says, I see nothing here in these variants. I see nothing here that much affects the genuineness of our Christian faith. If it were essential to the faith, that'd be all the more reason for working hard at it. Nor can there be any danger that everybody will forthwith abandon Christ if the news happens to get out that some passage has been found in Scripture which an ignorant or sleepy scribe has miscopied or some unknown translator has rendered inadequately. Mm. So Dorf's got this absolutist man. We, we can't find textual corruption. The Bible will be mistrusted. Christian faith will fall apart. And Erasmus actually responds from a textual confidence perspective and say, no, 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 no. Christian faith is stronger than textual variation. We got the Protestant Reformation shortly after that, so I think we did pretty good. I think so, too. Yeah. I think we did indeed. So, so Tim, Erasmus doesn't—I mean, where would he fit then on the textual absolutism to textual confidence spectrum? I think it's really clear that he would not fit into any form of the textual absolutist position. He held a textual confidence view. Over and over again in his writings, he's passionate to talk about textual variation, and he repeatedly— resist the accusations of his critics that that's dangerous to the Christian faith or dangerous to the authority of the Bible. And he gets those critics from all different corners. Uh, Dorp writes him before he publishes. He goes ahead and publishes his first edition in 1516, and criticism just multiplies. And, from and that let's point. be clear, that 1516 Novum Instrumentum Omne includes the Vulgate and the first printing of the Greek New Testament. That's right. Which is why we're talking about it today. It's that, but it's actually significant on these two levels. Yeah. It's significant. Well, it's, it's, the first, it's the first edition of the Greek New Testament. The, the composition published. was the first published. Right. Not printing. Not printing. First right. publishing. Right. right. And was it the Vulgate or it was Erasmus? It was actually Erasmus' was Erasmus's revision, revision of the Vulgate. Right. Exactly. Yes. I just think we should emphasize at this point that, you know, we know, like Erasmus, we know more about what Erasmus thought than almost any human being in history. Tim, would you mind holding up... Uh, we we know a lot about what Erasmus thought. Those are like two of like eighty projected volumes yeah. of Erasmus's collected works. Oh no, like, the the latter one is is one of like the eighty, and this is a different series. This is a they're... whole other set of critical editions of all the works of Erasmus. Oh, in that's the original. The, that's the original. Latin, this is right? the Brill one in original Latin and Greek. This is the translated work by uh, Toronto University Press. But yeah, there'll be in total. Almost 200 volumes. Oh, wow. Even bigger uh, than I thought. Eventually, when they're done, of the original text and the translations of Erasmus. Oh, between support. the two of them then. Yeah, between okay. the two of them. And Tim is always coming out in our conversations with little tidbits that he's been getting from reading uh, Erasmus. And it really is fascinating. So, so frequently when I go back to read Erasmus, or for me, especially the King James translators, I feel like, of course, I'm in a different era, but mainly it's the linguistic you know, uh, you know, style that's different. Actually, they're taking the same approach to the text that I do. We are recognizably exactly. in the yep. same yep. tradition. We so, want to we want to honor them by doing in our day what they did in theirs, rather than, you know, you know, saying like it was just 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 a brief analogy. Like, we don't honor the church planters of fifty years ago by saying only the churches that they planted are true churches. Mm. We honor the church planters of 50 years ago or 100 years ago by planting more churches today. Right. I just, you know, to uh, for our Heartland, our Heartland friends, church planting is a really big deal. And, you know, they honor the church planters of the previous generation by going out and starting more churches, which is what we all think should be done. Uh, we, we, that's a great idea. And we should do the same thing with the Bible that we do with the church. We should honor the textual work of the previous generations by doing textual work in our day. Yeah, that's you right. can't say we have planted churches once and for all, you know. Right. 
It's, it's a process that needs to be ongoing. So let's talk about those King James translators. You placed Erasmus, Tim, on the textual confidence end of the spectrum, the third and right view. Where did the King James translators fit? Let me just pause a second here. Um, you, when I first ran into you, we were just immediately were kindred spirits. We both love our brothers in the King James only world and have every reason to be gracious to them and enjoy going back and forth with them. So what you've been so good at, Tim, that I noticed was uh, uh, putting forth a clear knowledge of the history of the King James Bible. And you had a site, I now forget the URL of your old site, but it was so hard to navigate that I insisted that you let me make you <laughs> a new website. And I urge readers and listeners and viewers to go to kjbhistory.com where yep. you've got articles on the topic we're about to discuss. You are a recognized expert in this field. So again, place the King James translators on the spectrum that we're talking about. Confidence, textual confidence, textual absolutism, textual skepticism, where were they? Great, yeah. Those, that's an important question to consider because again, that spectrum has existed throughout church history before their work. And in their day, the primary form of absolutism was this view towards the Vulgate, that it was an inspired translation, uh, that it shouldn't be corrected. It was the Bible of the Western church. That comes to... Real clear expression at Trent when Trent just openly declares no other version should be used. And, and there's some Catholic apologists and scholars today would say, well, they didn't really mean that. But whatever they meant, that was how the decree came across and how it was interpreted. So now it's become kind of a Catholic-Protestant divide between Catholics firmly uh, asserting the authority of the Vulgate and Protestants pushing for English translation. Well, when the Catholics do finally sit down to, to write an English translation, they do it not for the common man. They do it to empower Catholics to fight against Protestants. And Gregory Martin writes a preface to it in 1582 when they published the New Testament. And his preface is really this whole long argument for textual absolutism. We've got the inspired Vulgate. We've got a trustworthy text. You shouldn't be trying to put it into English. English is a vulgar language. Once you put it into English, it's not really the word of God anymore. Well, the King James translators fundamentally disagree with that approach. And we can see that probably more clearly than anywhere else in the preface that Miles Smith writes for the King James Bible. To read that preface well, we need to understand two or three things. Number one, we need to understand what it is that Smith's talking about in that preface. As they're creating the King James Bible, we'll talk about this more in the next session, the King James Bible is a revision of the Bishop's Bible. And they knew the moment they went about the task of producing a revision of the Bible, some people were going to be unhappy. Well, who's going to be unhappy? Well, mostly textual absolutists who don't want the text revised. So in that document, Smith provides an argument for their new revision of the Bible, and he ends up pinning what is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful historical theological arguments against absolutism that's ever been penned. He takes up the claims that Gregory Martin has put forth in uh, the preface to the Rhymes edition, and he just argues against them blatantly and undercuts the basic views that lead towards textual absolutism. So in terms of the question of where do the King James translators fit, that preface shows us that Miles Smith, at least, one of the leading King James translators and one of the final revisers of the text in its final, uh, the final stage of its production, clearly stands against that absolutism. So let me, let me take just a minute then and kind of walk through that preface, how it works, um, what it is, and what it does. Tim, while you're bringing that up, can you remind me, uh, I, if I remember, um, when they when Miles Smith quotes the Bible in that preface, he actually quotes the Geneva Bible and not the King James? Very often. Some of the quotes are hard. They're not similar enough to pinpoint whether it's King James or Geneva. And some of them don't seem to match either, but most of the time he seems to quote Geneva over the King James in that preface. Yeah, because that's the Bible they've known and loved. This new Bible is brand new. It hasn't worked its way into their consciousness net yet. It hasn't worked its way into their liturgy yet. The Bible that he's used to uh, is, is the Geneva text. So yeah, he quotes the Geneva very often. And he lays out an argument. Um, and here's then the two things that I would suggest that we do well to read the preface well. And I will freely acknowledge that we don't always read the preface well. People on both sides of the debates that we're talking about have a tendency, in my opinion, to quote mine from the preface and grab a quote here and a quote there and really miss Smith's overall argument. So let me take two or three minutes and just give you what I think is Smith's overall argument. The first thing we need to do to read the preface well is realize he's talking about a revision of the Bible. All of his discussion about translation and where he's going, he's making a case for, an argument for, their brand new revision of the Bishop's Bible. 
The second thing we need to do well to read the preface well, which is very rarely done well, is to take account of the headings that he puts into that preface, the marginal headings. There's 15 of them, and they very clearly divide the structure of the work and let us see the flow of his argument. I would argue that there's three broad segments to that preface uh, as you look at how those headings are lined. The first three are all about calumniation, slander. He raises the fact that slander always comes against any new work. And in particular, when you go meddling with men's religion, slander is going to come your way. People are going to be upset about it. And then in the next nine headings, he talks about really his case against absolutism as he talks about the history of Bible translation and then the history of Bible revision. God gives the Bible in the original languages, but he says translation is necessary. And he walks through the history we've just talked about, the, the translation of the Old Testament uh, into Greek. But then that translation, he says, did not contend the learned. So what did they do with it? They revised it. So Aquila, and he names a whole bunch of others, and mo modern scholarship on the LXX would paint things a little differently. But from his perspective, the point is that translation wasn't inspired, it wasn't perfect, and therefore it was subject to continuing revision. He does the same thing with the Latin. He says the Latin was produced, the old Latin text, but it didn't content the learned. So Jerome had to revise it. What's he doing? He's making an argument that there's a long history of revising the Bible. Absolutism can't say, don't touch my Bible when the church has been doing it for so long. He gets to the third section or the third part of that center segment. And he says, even in translations into our languages, lots of other language in English, lots of English Bibles have appeared. Well, what does that mean? It means the Bible's not only been put in English, it's been revised. So then he starts to raise very specific objections that might come against this uh, text. First, he sets aside the Catholic ab objection to the idea of English Bibles altogether. He says, they don't want the Bible divulged in the mother tongue. <laughs> we do. Right. We want the Bible for the plowboy. We want the Bible in English. That for the very read. vulgar. Yes, for the very vulgar. Then he begins to specifically set out Protestant objections, which he calls my right. brother. Can I just jump in there? Mm -hmm. Very vulgar does not mean very potty mouth. <laughs> it means for the common, for the boys in the basketball court, for the plowboy. What? That's what no. I thought it was for my neighbor. <laughs> the vulgate, right? It's right. The common, right. It's the common people. <laughs> And, and, and that idea that, you know, what was once for the common man is no longer for the common man. So now we need to put it into their speech. So that process didn't stop. So just, I just thought that would. Another little yeah. tidbit, the Syriac Peshitta, which is the name of the old, you know, Syriac translation. Peshitta also means common or vulgar, you know, vulgate. And somebody pointed out to me recently, when you see English standard version, revised standard version, it's performing essentially the same function. Carry on, Tim. Even the term received text, TR. Sure that yeah. we use it. The idea is a revol of uh, vulgar in the sense of standard or common edition. So in this next two or three little headings, the last part of this central segment, he raises what he calls the speeches and reasons, both of our, both of our brethren, which are the Protestants, and our adversaries, which are the Catholics. So now he's going to respond very specifically to the objections that textual absolutists in the Protestant realm and in the Catholic realm have against this new revision of the Bible. First, he raises a satisfaction to our brethren. And their basic objection is, wait a minute, if you produce a new revision of the Bible, then you're saying we didn't have the Bible before? I mean, was that which came before not good? And he understands, well, that's natural to think that way. If the Bible's being revised, that means we didn't have the Bible before. But actually, that's a textual absolutist framework because the Bible can be God's word imperfectly before, during, and after revision. Then he takes up really in one small section the objection of the Puritans among the Protestants. <laughs> Puritans loved the Geneva Bible. They didn't really want a new translation. It had kind of been foisted on them. And his answer to them is really simple. He says, but you asked for it. <laughs> yeah. At Hampton at Court. Hampton Court it was the right? Puritans that said, let's have a new translation. You probably, he says, you probably didn't mean it, but you asked for it. So there. <laughs> <laughs> then he moves to the Catholic objections. This is the longest heading in the preface by far. It's the biggest section. And he takes up three objections um, that the Roman Catholics have raised against uh, the text. He, he raises first this Catholic objection from Gregory Martin that English translations aren't the word of God. They're imperfect. It's a vulgar language. And again, there's, there's such a parallel to the way absolutists always tend to think, well, the Bible should be in a majestic language. Latin is the majestic language of right. the church. It's the it, language of it scholarship. It has the social cachet too, the language yeah, of scholarship. Exactly. It, it's the language. And English that, does not. English at that time, nobody's giving lectures in English, right? Nobody's teaching in the universities in English. Everything academic is done in Latin. So the idea of putting the Bible into English, well, you're really putting the Bible down on the, the cookies are way too far on the low shelf. It's exactly the thing that we have today 
where people are saying, no, it, it should be in this exalted language. We have to remember yes. Latin was so prevalent that the English of 1611 today is, would have been like using Latin in 1611. That's right. And today, exactly the same thing. Yep. We have people saying today that the King James uses something they call biblical English, like our English really isn't capable. Or R.B. Willette in his book, A More Sure Word, Which Bible Can You Trust, said that English reached its pinnacle, its summit in the era of the King James, and it's only degraded since then. And I cannot help but hear, echoing in my head, those Roman Catholic clerics from the 14th and into the 15th, am I doing it right? Yeah, century, who are complaining about Wycliffe's translation and said that very thing. You can't express God's words in English. To them, Latin had all the necessary terminology. English was uh, for the plowboy and not for the scholars and not for religion. That's right. And Smith takes up that claim exactly and says, we deny that. And we affirm and avow that the very meanest translation of our Bible yes, in English that's so good. is still the word of God. He's taking up that absolutist claim and saying, no, 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 no. It doesn't have to be in the high register of Latin that only the academics can read. Yes, English translation is imperfect. Yes, it muddles the text just a little bit because you can't perfectly bring over the originals into English. But our English translations against the Catholic absolutist are still God's word. And he uses this beautiful analogy of the first and the second temple and how in the first temple, yes. obviously, there's all of Solomon's glory and God's there in such a powerful way. And when they build the second temple under Zerubbabel, people weep in disappointment. It's so much less glorious. But you know what? God was still in both. And Smith says the same thing about translation. Yes, the original is beautiful and it's glorious and God's there in such power. And yes, translation is something lesser and it's messier and it's imperfect, but God is still in both. So that's this first claim of the Catholic absolutist that he takes up. The second claim of the Catholic absolutist that he takes up is for oft revising and amending our translations. Yeah. The Catholics are saying, you guys keep coming out with English Bibles. You keep revising them. You keep changing them. So therefore, you don't have an authoritative text. Mm. How can you have an authoritative Bible if you keep altering it and amending it and correcting it and changing it? And his answer is to say that revising translations of the Bible, revising the Bible itself in those forms, doesn't undermine authority. In the, in the longest paragraph in the preface, he takes up this argument and he says, don't throw stones if you live in a glass house. Mm. <laughs> you adversaries have been revising your editions of the Vulgate for centuries. <laughs> and a copy came out and a pope declared it good. And then another form came out and that pope declared it good. And you've revised them and revised them and revised them. But you still recognize that you have an authoritative text. So revision doesn't undermine the ability of scripture to still speak authoritatively and the like we should think of Protestant translations. Yes, we're revising the Bible. We're producing a new revision of the English text, but that doesn't undermine the authority of scripture. So what, what Smith has done here in coming to this point, he's undermined the core idea behind absolutism that if you revise the Bible, if you change the Bible, if in you don't have it in translation or even in text, you don't have an authoritative text. And he's saying, no, there is a long history throughout the history of the church of God's people using imperfect translations that were still the word of God and always pressing for greater revision of them to make them better and better. And the latter thoughts are thought to be the wiser. The later revisions obviously are going to be better, generally speaking, than the newer ones. That doesn't mean we didn't have scripture before. It doesn't mean we don't have scripture now, and it doesn't mean we can't continue the work of revision. And just to be clear, when, when we're talking about changing the Bible, we're talking about improving our translation. We're right. talking about improving our understanding, our, 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 our access to what God said, not changing what God said right. to make it somehow, if we could make what God said better, but rather that we're going to express it more clearly, more precisely. Exactly. We're going to get the wording more accurate. So it's like, you know, and we'll get to this in more detail later, uh, but Dirk Youngkin in his, his wonderful little book, uh, which we have right here, um, he has this idea that we're not talking about keep taking, my book on top. Okay, we'll keep your book on top. <laughs> Thank there. you, because it's authorized, right? Yes, um, I authorized it. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not taking about taking one picture of Jesus and replacing it with a different picture of Jesus. We're t we're talking about taking one picture and 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 increasing the resolution of that picture, right? Because every pixel is precious, right? Um, and that, that image is so good that like there can be distortion in an image. And it's still the same image. Still recognizable. Right? But because yeah. it's the word of God and we love the word of God, we want to remove the distortion and we'll never do it perfectly. And sometimes, you know, anyone who's 
played around in Photoshop knows this and or worked with with pictures, you you improve the picture in one respect, <laughs> and you you uh, you lower in in another respect that you're able to <laughs> yeah. you're able to to uh, or working with manuscript images, you you make mm -hmm. one part of the text more visible. Elijah's Elijah knows this. He does this a lot. Um, you're you're making the text more visible in one respect, but something else on the page becomes less visible, uh, and so you're constantly working to get the best possible overall image. Um, and of course, there's a benefit and an argument for working with yeah. multiple images, <laughs> but it's it's the same text, same text, same picture. We're not so, we're not trying to change that. You brought up Derek Yonkin. I used to work for Dirk. Um, he's a friend of mine, and I have all the respect in the in the world for him. And one time, I remember sitting in his office with him, and he turned to me and he said, "This." is the word of God. This is the word of God that we're dealing with. Every letter of it is worth losing sleep over. Uh, speaking of multiple images. Well, and that's, Pete would say not even the letters, even the breathing marks are worth yeah, losing yeah. sleep over. <laughs> uh, that's great. And Dirk is a godly man that I also have great respect for. I love that book. It's one of my f uh, first recommendations to people when they want to get into understanding textual criticism. Speaking of multiple images, you gave a great one there, Peter, of um, the uh, resolution of an image and trying to improve it. And I've noticed that one of the outstanding uh, elements of that preface for, for in the King James is the number of images that they come up, up with in general. It's just beautiful. And specifically regarding revision. And what I've realized is if you don't speak two languages and really actually not just speak, but have a somewhat academic working knowledge of them. Um, if you've never actually translated anything, it's really hard to understand what, why would a translation need revision? Now? Yeah. Why can't you just do the translation and it's accurate, it's word for word, and then you're done. So they use images in the preface like, don't you want to keep polishing the brass? Not on a sinking ship, but you know, you, you just <laughs> go at it again and nobody thinks bad of you. You know, nobody thinks bad of people who um, go back at their work previously. They think that's actually wise or they use a, an another image on a different angle. They say, I should say Miles Smith says in that preface, although he's representing all the translators, I think, because it says translators to the reader. We can talk about right. that, Tim. Um, he says, we don't count a man to be ugly because he has a wart on his hand. Right. Um, so you can do a great translation that produces something really beautiful, but it can have these little warts and, mm -hmm. and they're saying it's good to get rid of those. I have to say this now. I saw a King James only website where I think they were trying to translate the preface into more readable English. And instead of the first heading, yeah, ironic, <laughs> um, instead of the first heading be, being the best things have been calumniated, you know, calumny is slander, malicious slander. Mm -hmm. It said the best things have been culminated. <laughs> And I think they're, they were trying to say, oh, you know, the King James is the best thing. It's is the culmination of all Bible translation, <laughs> which rather runs against the content of that <laughs> That's preface. Right. And let's, let's be explicit here. The King James translators, in a little uh, piece of text that I actually have coded into my um, uh, uh, iOS shortcuts, um, because I have to say this so frequently to people in comments on YouTube, they said, there is no cause why the word translated should be denied to be the word right? or forbidden to be current. And that's a false friend. That means circulated. The other day I had somebody ask me, what does that mean? You know, they're, they're, they're saying that it needs to be in current language. No, actually they're not. That would be convenient for me, but they're not. Um, it shouldn't be denied to be the word, forbidden to be current, notwithstanding that some imperfections and blemishes may be noted in the setting forth of it. For we ask, whatever was perfect under the sun, where apostles or apostolic men, that is, men endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit and privileged with the privilege of infallibility had not their hand. In other words, it takes inspiration to make a perfect translation. And they answer, this is so, this, this really hurts my heart to have to see them repeatedly answering directly the stuff that I have to handle on Facebook. And I just wish over and over again that people would, in the King James only world, and textual absolutist world a little bit more generally would read this, they, he, uh, Miles Smith answers the implicit claim in that infamous King James only book by David Otis Fuller that in my mind kind of launched the modern King James only movement, which Bible same with RB Willette, who I've met. And I think is a true brother in Christ. And I really enjoyed meeting him, but he says in his, uh, subtitle of his book, which Bible can you trust? And what is, what is the preface saying? There's no cause why the word translated should be denied to be the word, notwithstanding that some imperfections and blemishes are noted in the setting forth of it. So the 
the answer that he gives to the challenge of the Catholics is being brought up. You know, the, the same challenge the Catholics brought. Well, hey, why do you have so many Bibles? You need one standard. You're, you Fisiparous, you know, Protestants are always multiplying like rabbits. You're, uh, <laughs> you're uh, having 12 children. No, that's not the part that uh, you're, you're having so many um, different standards. That same charge is brought by our King James only brothers to this day. Um, and they're saying, which Bible? Well, the King James translators answered that. That's right. They're all the Bible. That's right. And, and it's okay it's to kind say of like so. It's kind of like saying, which of your children is your children? You have to have a perfect standard when right. actually they all reflect you. And I have yeah. four different children, and all of them reflect my wife and I. And all of them, well, all of them are our children equally, but they're all our children differently. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and I'm, I'm thankful for all four of them. Well, and let me bounce off something that you said earlier and something then that you just said, because really w what's happening there when they're discussing whether multiple translations, in their case, looking back at history before Bishop's Bible, Geneva Bible, yeah, Tyndale, Matthews, before, Coverdale. But they're, they're really raising this core absolutist presupposition that I should take one particular form of the picture and see every other form of that image as not really God or every particular form of the Bible and every other image of the Bible, therefore, every other form is not the word of God. That's the core absolutist presupposition, whether in Protestants that he talks to or whether in Catholics. And that's coming up again today in every form of absolutism. Because once you fasten on a particular form of the text, you said it so well earlier, Peter, we're not talking about revising what God said, changing what God said, judging what God said. But we're recognizing that what God said is bigger than any particular copy or translation. So we fix copies, we adjust translations, but we're not altering God or his word. Right. We're altering our particular copy or translation it's, of it's, God. It's word. recognizing, it's, it's really, it really goes back in so many ways. It goes back to the Garden of Eden where being willing to accept our human limitations rather than trying to stand in God's place. Mm -hmm. We want to say, if I can't stand in God's place, I can't trust God. Yeah. That's, that's the absolutist temptation. And I know, I just want to be very clear, the vast majority, maybe all of the, the people I would say that you're attached to absolutist, they would not want to be standing in God's place. And yet, that's the, those are the steps that lead down that road where you say, if I, can't, if I can't have the same access to the scriptures that God has, then I have no access. If I can't see as God sees, mm. then I can't see. And, and I just want to say, no. Right. <laughs> no. Across the board, every age, every way, every topic. And, and this, is, this comes up in theology all the time, like, if I, can't, if I can't harmonize, if I can't understand how God's sovereignty works, then I can't trust it. And it's like, well, no, God's bigger than you. That's the point. That, right. That's the point. God's bigger than we are. And I've, I've seen that actually happen. I've seen people say that, like, they've, they've turned to textual absolutism because they were going through their NA28 and, and taking it on themselves to resolve every single textual variant mm. to their own satisfaction. Which is, I mean, why not just trust that God is powerful enough to give you what he thinks you need? Yeah. I mean, and this is why I think it's so important to put Jesus Christ yes. as the center, yeah. um, the son of God who died for us in, in uh, him, our faith belongs. Yeah. And when he is our center of our faith. I, pastorally, and I'm I'm an associate pastor at a Southern Baptist church. Also, um, you know, I have told people, look, if you if you want to read the King James and believe it, um, every single word of it, <clears throat> and uh, believe every single word of it, beginning to end, and live your life that way. Fundamentally, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, you know, I I would disagree with some of the readings in the King James, but I think if you believe them, you're going to be okay yeah. when you have to stand before God. Yeah. Same with the ESV. That's right. Same with and the NIV. That's, and that's, that's one of the things, like, I am not opposed to the person in the pew that's read the King James their whole life and wants to keep reading it. Right. That's not the problem. The problem is when they turn it into a weapon that they're attacking other believers and they're taking the Bible away from, I'm not trying to take the Bible away from them. I'm opposed to them taking the Bible away from right. others. Right. That happened at my church recently. I, in our adult Sunday school class, one of the ladies came in and she said, is the NIV okay? Like, and I could see it in her face. She was really worried. And she said, I just, you know, it's hard for me to understand the King James. I just really like the NIV. But I came, I met this person the other day that was just telling me that I can't trust it. And I was just really worried about that. Or, or my anecdote is I walked into the cabin 
at the count Christian camp where I was counseling. This is the summer after my sophomore year of college. And I heard arguing. This is the very first day. I hadn't even met all the campers yet. And there were two kids arguing. I still remember the name of one of them. This is t over 20 years ago now. And what I heard was, that ain't no Bible. You should burn that. <laughs> and that was... I've uh, said that before. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the kid who was told that and was rather indignant at being told he should burn his Bible. That kid was <laughs> Rightly holding, so. <laughs> that kid was holding an NIV. And the other kid, of course, had his King James. Come to find out, both kids were bus kids who had no church background. Who knows how long, how many months maybe they'd been going to church. But that one kid who told the other kid to burn his NIV Bible, what had he picked up at church? Textual absolutism. Yeah. It came out later because I, I cared about my campers. I loved them. And a day before Facebook, I tried to keep up with them and I would write them letters. I, I found out that kid didn't know the gospel. But he knew that every other Bible was corrupt. And, and what does that say about what he's hearing from the pulpit? Exactly. That he picks yeah. that up before he picks up the gospel. Right. And, yeah. and, and when it's just, it's what's at the center, that it's not about this church uses the King James and this church is uses, uses the ESV or whatever. It's not about that. Yeah. It's about what are we, what are we putting at the center of people's faith? Yeah. Right. And, the, and what are we, yeah. So the, the King, King James onlyism nearly always in my experience i actually am an odd collector i collect king james only doctrinal statements i probably have over 200 of them wow. screenshots <laughs> in my um folder in dropbox if you want to hack it you can go see it for yourself and the, uh, bibliology is always first yep. thankfully the king james itself is not usually first it's rarely first they they say other things that i believe in first but it's always at, at least at the end of that first paragraph it has become the symbol, the totem, the banner waved by a group of Christians as a means of dividing from others. And, and I want to say something here. We call uh, the view of our opponents um, past and present, textual absolutism. And our group cares a lot. Tim and I have talked especially a lot about this, about using terms that our opponents, who are our brothers and sisters in Christ right. in this case, um, with very few exceptions, you know, I think there are true extremists who I just have to wonder, is there any love of Christ in them? Peter Ruckman is one. But um, we want to use a label that they can acknowledge. Yeah. In this case, I find it doubtful that any one of them is going to want to be called a textual absolutist. Sure. But what sure. we're trying to say here is we are trying to represent them fairly. Yeah. We really are. Yeah. And over and over again, they call it standard sacred text, but it has undeniable resonances with the same stuff that textual absolutists defending the Vulgate yeah. or previous English translations, what have you, used back in the days of the King James translator. So this is an area we're stepping out on a limb. Yeah, probably our, our brothers and sisters in that world would not agree with this terminology, but in good conscience, we can give it and say we think we're representing their position accurately. Now, Tim, let's go back to your knowledge of King James Bible history. And I've always appreciated about this, you, in fact, uh, about you. Uh, I tell my wife that you're the king of anti-King James onlyism. I hope that you don't uh, mind my saying that. You actually are a little skeptical about using that uh, label King James onlyism precisely because you yeah. want to be charitable That's toward right. your opponents. It's just really difficult for me not to because I was raised in a community that that was, the, that was our own terminology for ourselves. So sure. I don't see it as a slight against my brothers in that world because we used it when I yeah. was there. Um, but whatever you call it. Um, you're really good at the history, and you brought up something to me in conversation recently, super helpful. Daniel Featley, one of the King James translators, I, he has some quotes that I want, really want you to share uh, because I'm not so strong on the history. I, I'm what I would call a philologist. I love words, and I love the history of English. Um, and I, all I really knew about the history of the King James translators and what they'd said about their work was um, mainly the preface, and then we've got various notes and, you know, the 1602 Bodmer uh, uh, edition, blah, blah, blah. You'll talk more about that if you need to. But you brought out another King James translator, Daniel Featley, who actually did talk about translation. I would really love for you to share some of the quotes yeah. you got from him. So ju just a quick note about Featley first. So the list of translators mentioned in Mr. Fairclough, without necessarily identifying most of them in the list, don't give a full name, just a doctor so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so. So there was some debate in the past about who that was exactly, whether it was a Richard Fairclough or Daniel 
whose name original was originally was Daniel Fairclough and it was changed to Featley. Most scholars have landed, in fact, I think universally have landed today on the realization that Daniel Featley is the translator being mentioned there. Very, very distinguished scholar, very well known for his translation work, his work in uh, ancient Oriental languages. So he preached a sermon against the Anabaptist that he was debating with and arguing with in his day, which is, again, a really clear sign that the King James translators weren't Baptists. He's arguing very firmly and adamantly against the dippers dipped, as he calls them in <laughs> so the, the title. Just, just the, the people he's arguing, he's arguing against at that point would have been some of the, the antecedents of modern-day Baptists. They were not actually Anabaptists from like the Mennonites, but right. he was calling them Anabaptists. Right, he was right. lumping them in, but they were indignant about being so lumped in. <laughs> right. And, and from his perspective, it's just to cast them into the radical reformation. Right. Exactly. Like his idea is just to say, oh, they're those radicals. The Anglican church as a whole had a tendency to fight Catholicism on one side and the radical reformers on the other side mm -hmm. and to really push against both of those directions. Well, when he uh, responds to his opponents there, he describes that they're arguing about something they really shouldn't be. He says, you don't know the original languages. And it raises for him in this sermon the question of what is what he calls the undoubted word of God. And he gets to the point where he explains to him they probably shouldn't be arguing this in the first place because they don't speak the original languages. And he makes a distinction between the undoubted word of God and the doubtable or doubted word of God. The undoubted word of God can only be in the original languages. A translation, therefore, from his perspective, is never the undoubted word of God. Let me read what he says. He says, Scripture in the original languages, uh, none of you understand. He says, no, this is quoting Featley now, uh, King James translator who served on those first six companies, no translation is simply authentical. And that's a the, false friend. That means authoritative. Right, right. Uh, so no translation is simply authoritative or the undoubted word of God. In the undoubted word of God, the original languages, there can be no error. But in translations, there may be and are errors. Now, this is in 1645, four decades almost after the King James translation has been uh, completed. He says, the Bible translated, therefore, is not the undoubted word of God, but so far only as it agreeeth with the original. So no notion here at all that an English translation, not even the King James Bible, could be taken as original. Now, his opponents have this objection to the Bible being read in liturgy, in the, the Book of Common Prayer, the, the uh, liturgy of the Anglican Church at the time, and they're objecting to it partly on the basis of the translation that's being used in the liturgy. And he says in response, for first, if no translation may be read in the church, but that which is free from all error, then none at all ought to be read, for there is none in which there are not some mistakes, more or less. Here's a King James translator freely acknowledging that all English translations, including the now going on three decades King James Bible, is not free from error. So he says this, translations don't have, he makes a real clear qualification. He says translations done by Protestants, he would distinguish Protestant and Catholic translations. Translations done by Protestant don't contain errors concerning, quote, faith or manners. In other words, the essentials of the faith, those are accurate in every English Protestant translation. Otherwise, we don't have the word of God. But they've got the, the faith and manners without error. But, he says, other slips outside of faith and manners, the essentials, other slips, to quote him again, must be born with all in translations or else we must read none at all till we have a translation given by divine inspiration as the original, originals are. Firmly wow. rebuts the absolutism of his day. Firmly affirms that the King James Bible is itself a translation with errors and that and all not given by divine and, and, and not given yeah, by and, divine. And, and that was, the, that was one of the things like I, I basically came to realize like the only consistent position that leads to King James only practice is Ruckman's position that it was given oh. by divine inspiration. Like you, you have stole to stole the end of the next session from me, Peter. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we but can get that it was back. just, we, 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 we no, can, no, no, we can no, hit I'm, it again. You're, it's, you're it's worth absolutely hitting. right. But, but realizing when I started to read the preface and, and started to know a little bit of the history, not anywhere near as much as Tim knows about it, but, realizing not only did they have to be inspired, they had to be unwittingly inspired, mm -hmm. you know, to right. which the response I got, well, Caiaphas was unwittingly inspired. I'm like, Caiaphas yes, didn't but, write a Bible. <laughs> yeah, Caiaphas didn't write a Bible. Are we wanting to say, you know, are we wanting to say that, you know, these men were wrong about many areas of theology? You know, I'm a firm Baptist and I believe in believers baptism. So they got that all wrong. They got all these things wrong. Um, so they, they weren't kept from error in any other area of their life. They were completely unaware of being inspired. Um, in fact, they repeatedly denied that they were. Uh, and that just doesn't, I just don't see the spirit of God, you know, and then how did we come to know? We didn't know that they were inspired and being translated until hundreds of years later. So God didn't give any sign that they did that. You know, you start, you start multiplying impossibilities, 
you know, to the point where it just becomes <sighs> ridiculous. What kind of God does that? What kind of what kind of picture of God does that paint? Yep. What kind of God would do something like that? It's, yep. a, it's a gotcha thing. You know, it, it seems like and it's one of the things that I've I've dealt with was there's some there's some textual variance where there is no manuscript support that exists now. And the response that I've heard is within well, the King James. The King James uses readings right, right. that aren't found anywhere. Right. right. And the response is, well, you don't know what manuscripts there were. We don't know how many have 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 disappeared since then. And my thought is, OK, let's just assume that's true. Now we have a God who has left hundreds, in some cases, thousands of the wrong Bible, the corrupt mm -hmm. Bible. And and not only has he, in his providence, allowed all of the true readings to be destroyed, he's left hundreds of copies of the corruption for us to have. Yeah. Like, is that what we would expect from God? And I, you know, I want to be, I want to be careful not to take that too far. But like, if you're going to go down, the, you know, because I think it can be dangerous. Like, this is what you know God should be like. We want to actually, what did God actually do? Right. You know, but at the same time, if we're going to go down that road, we should be consistent. We should say, like, okay, so what story are you actually telling? <laughs> what story are you actually telling? Is it something where, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think an overriding principle here is we want to key our level of absolutism to what God has actually said, warranted. Yeah. Right. And so I am a resurrection absolutist. Yeah. Absolutely. Jesus absolutely rose from Amen. the dead three days after he absolutely died. And he absolutely died for my sins, according to the scriptures. Absolutely. And I have absolutely no hope apart from Christ. I'm a ton of absolutisms. Would you I'm absolutely affirm the virgin birth, which I, which I absolutely affirm? I absolutely I do. I absolutely do. Well. <laughs> so there's a lot of absolutists in here. Why aren't we textual absolutists? It's because we are trying to stay faithful to what God has actually given us. Right. Or why aren't we theological absolutists about every point of our theology? Now, I'm a resurrection absolutist. I'm a gospel absolutist. But am I an absolutist about believer's baptism? No, I'm not. I recognize some measure that I believe God has allowed of ambiguity and difficulty. So if you, broadly speaking, if you take a big view of, of the whole Bible at, you know, and see Old Testament and New Testament with more continuity, you end up in the infant baptism side. And if you see less continuity between the two Testaments, then you end up on the credo baptist side. Like, and that is where I am. And I think it's important, but I don't treat that uh, debate the same way I would treat debate with a non-Christian over the resurrection of Jesus because I'm trying to key my level of absolutism to what God's actually revealed. Elijah. It's okay, Mark. You can be wrong about baptism. Okay. <laughs> Still love you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elijah. I've been given permission to be wrong. Yeah, this is really helpful. So do you, and do you believe different do you believe differently about baptism? I think it baptism is the immersion of a professing believer. Well, I'm a credo baptist too. As a, but I, I would say there is no such thing as infant baptism. It's oh, infant I see. sprinkling. Yeah, sure. yes. not baptism. Okay. Right. I, then, I would be. I would You're probably be more strong. Meaner about yeah. it. Yeah. But, but, but I, I have. So I would be. I would be very strong on <laughs> believers baptism too. But I would say I would be stronger on the resurrection. I think it's right. right. Oh yeah. I, I, yeah. No, theological triage. Right. Right. One of my like, best friends is is an unbaptized brother in Christ. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I love yeah. the guy. That that that's our point here. Yeah. Okay. So. There is textual absolutism combated by the King James translators and so much more eloquently than we could ever do on even our best days and so clear. So one of the best testimonies to the clarity of this argument is that I think one of my favorite opponents online, one of the guys who actually tries to listen to what I say and what a gift that is in an opponent. That is so rare. It does happen. It's rare. He has to resort, and you know who I'm talking about, Tim. He has to resort to saying, well, the preface was only the, the opinion of Miles Smith, and actually it was just an advertisement for the King James. Um, and like you were saying a little bit earlier, Peter, he treats, you know, when, when backed into the corner by the preface, he says, well, of course they were fallible, and, you know, they didn't, they didn't know that they were being inspired by God, much like Caiaphas. Um, but I think that's eloquent testimony to the value of the preface here, because if you have to resort to saying the King James translators were not a good representation of what the King James is, I feel like we're, that puts us in the stronger position. Yeah. Tim, you wanted to add? Yeah, I'll just add in a collection of Miles Smith's sermons published in 1632, his friend and biographer, 
tells a little uh, story about him creating the preface and writing it, and he says that he did so in the name of all the translators. So here within just two decades of the King James is the preface being read as Miles Smith writing to represent all the rest. That doesn't mean he always does so perfectly. I think there's certainly spots where not everyone would have agreed with what he writes in the preface. But overall, he was definitely trying to represent all the translators. Let's talk about textual absolutism of text now again, not translation. And we got to keep those two things distinct for a lot of reasons. But um, it's easy to pick up the idea, as I certainly did when I was within King James Onlyism, that textual absolutism was the history of the church until some really stupid bad guys, Wes Cotton Hort, came along and ruined it all. I mean, Sometimes I look at the way their views are represented, I think, I mean, what kind of dummy would ever accept the views of West Cotton Hort if this is what they actually mm. said? Trigellus, um, Trigellus. <laughs> but if you look at the history, textual absolutism does not reign even in text, let alone translation as we've covered. So, Tim, we've kind of, you put together some um, examples here, Bentley. Yeah. And Mills and some of their editions. Can you talk about that and help us yeah. shift to text? Just as we've talked about that textual absolutism history, I do like to speak broadly in one sense, but if nothing else, because it gives us a respected history of people who've slipped into that way of thinking, you know, Origen and Irenaeus and Justin. We can look at those guys and nobody would attack. I'll say this just from my heart. You guys might not all agree with this, but it breaks my heart when people attack and make fun of my brothers and sisters who defend the King James as though they're just too stupid to listen to. And I just shudder and go, who would talk about Justin Martyr that way, right? Like who would do that to them? But I do think we need to be really careful as we talk about textual absolutism today on the modern scene in relation to the King James Bible to not lump them all together when they have different views. Most of the people that I meet today who defend the King James Bible or the TR, they do not want to be identified with Peter Ruckman or Gail Ripplinger, and they deservedly shouldn't be. They're much more intelligent, much more gracious, much more Christ-like in their character, much more careful with their sources, and they hold a distinctly different position. So yes, I'm willing to say broadly they're all under the umbrella of some form of textual absolutism, but let me sketch out what I think are five different forms of textual absolutism today uh, in relation to the King James Bible and the TR. First, I want to deal with two extreme ones and then three more moderate ones. The two extreme ones are the ones that unfortunately get all the press. Peter Ruckman comes along and he writes his book Bible Babble in uh, 64, and he just takes an absurd position that's never heard in the history of the church, that the text of the King James Bible is fresh revelation from God. Errors in the King James Bible are advanced revelation that correct even what was written in the original autographs. Well, that's an incredibly extreme view that nobody else holds. That goes way beyond, that goes way beyond the the perfect translation of the 70. Right, like yeah. This is, this is going beyond that. It is, it, is, it is an aberration in the history of the church, and it just breaks my heart when other people who hold some of those more moderate views get lumped in together with him as Ruckmanites, and they're not. So Ruckman is one of the extreme views. A slightly less extreme view that was popularized by Gail Ripplinger is what I would call KJV only. There are people that are happy to own that title. They love that title. They aren't claiming that the King James Bible corrects the original autographs. They will claim, like Daniels claims regularly, the King James Bible corrects every form of the Greek text extant today because they don't think there's a Greek text today that perfectly reflects the autographs. Daniels is with the Chick Publications. Yes, Society. yes. Uh, David. David Daniels, yeah. Publishes it. And yeah, you've reviewed one of them. Not David books. Daniel, the eminent no, biographer. No, no, no. Very Kindle. different. Yeah. Very different two very people. different don't people. Mix those two up. Yeah. They did both love the King James Bible and older English translations, but in very different ways. So you have Ruckmanism is a really extreme form. Another somewhat extreme form is KJV only, and I think we can use that term of those people. The other three forms are not like those two. They need to be distinguished from them. They need to be recognized as being held by more moderate individuals who have a much more healthy view of the text. The first one that I would describe is what I call KJV defenders, and it's a little bit more broad of a view. It has a long history that goes back at least to the beginning of the 1800s. I think I can find examples of it in the 1700s. People just trusting the Bible in front of them and assuming that it's perfect. Some of them with no knowledge of the history of the original languages, because the King James becomes so popular from 1660 to 1830, they just assume that's the original text. They don't know any better. They've got a King James Bible, they read it, and I, I would say they're not in any real danger. They're reading a King James Bible, trusting a King James Bible, and they just assume that's what Paul wrote. Understandable, long history, not holding these weird extreme views of uh, Ruckman and Ripplinger. And you see that with translations that have a long use, like that you happens do. with the Dutch translation. Mm -hmm. That happens with, uh, I, I, I know, and, and someone told me about that, but you know, you can see that with lots of different um, standard translations. Lots of different yeah. standard translations yeah. that they Very just common. assume that what I have, because my grandparents had it, yep. um, must go all the way back. Yeah. 
So that, that, that view is not necessarily resorting to any claim about the original language text or preservation. It's just my King James Bible is God's word. It's got a long history. Then another of the more moderate views is what I would describe as KJB slash TR defenders. And these are people, I think, partly influenced by some of those more extreme views, although they hold a different view. In their perspective, the King James Bible and the TR are both perfect. They are inerrant. David Cloud is a perfect example. He defends the absolute authority of the King James and the absolute authority of the TR. While can, carefully distinguishing himself from yeah, Ruckmanism. He's absolutely not a Ruckman. And he it's points out in pained language how it hurts him to be called a Ruckmanite or KJV only. When he doesn't hold a KJV only view, he's not a Ruckmanite. And, and he'll and he'll call out like someone like Yale Ripley or he does. obvious her yeah. obvious slanders. Uh, I think he makes like I think you know just reading him. I think he was someone as, as a teenager that like just looking at the spectrum that really influenced me. That sure. I you know, but then I just came to realize he didn't know what he was talking about. Well, and sure, a lot of things. Like he he actually was much more careful. He is much less slanderous. And so if you know you're looking for a healthier defending of, of King James, right. Only his position, I would I would point to him, but still. He just doesn't know how manuscripts work. Sure, and I would say he's wrong about some things. I disagree with him, but I want to show him the respect of not lumping him in with Gail Ripley. Accurately, I want to show my position. yeah. I want to represent his position accurately and not just throw him together as though he was another Peter Ruckman. Right. Then there's a third view of the more moderate that I would say is the most moderate and steps away entirely from the idea of an absolute translation. And I would just call them broadly TR defenders. We can think of guys like Edward Freer Hills, Theodore Letus, uh, s several others that take that claim today. The Trinitarian Bible. The Society. Trinitarian Bible. Society is probably the most prominent example today. They freely acknowledge that at least in principle, the King James Bible could be revised. They're not claiming that it's verbally perfect, but they do claim that the Greek text behind it is an absolute authority that can't be revised or changed. I think it's important to make those distinctions because people's views need to be represented fairly and accurately, and they don't want to be lumped in in a massive guilt by association technique. And I'll just be honest, this happens a lot in people who write against King James onlyism. And I, I won't name some names. I'm tempted to, but people with very prominent works about the King James only movement. Or what does King it James... rhyme with? What does his name rhyme with? Uh, you know, are we doing that? <laughs> are we doing that really? No. Okay, we won't yeah, go there. In, you know, in the interest of of fairly um, assessing views, I like Hills is is a conundrum for me because I've read a bit of him, and he does come across as exactly as you depended. The TR can't is an absolute authority, but. In Believing Bible Study, page 210 of the edition I've got, he talks about the, the comma Johannium, which is a, a passage in 1 John 5. Um, and he says, a reading, he, this is a reading, his, a reading which is admittedly is uncertain, but which on believing principles must be regarded as at least possibly genuine. Yeah. Well, that to me doesn't sound like the TR cannot be improved. Right. But mm, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how to how to read that in light of other things that he said. Sure. And, and admittedly, Hills has been read differently by different people. Right. He, he very commonly gets claimed by every single one of these groups. Ruckman sells or before he passed, sells copies of Hills's books in his library. Like everyone claims Hills because of his credentials. But if you read Hills carefully, he's absolutely convinced not. I shouldn't say absolutely convinced. He's willing to acknowledge that there can be errors in the King James. But push come to shove, he won't point to a single error in the TR. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are there's variety here, and the very weakest, you know, in a way, the the most moderate, the TR defenders. I can think of individuals, however, where yes, in principle, when pressed, they acknowledge we don't have a perfect TR. But one of the other elements of textual absolutism is how do they treat alternatives? Right. And so if they're saying that the ESV and the NIV are corrupt, darkly warning everyone about the errors right. in those Bibles, then even if they can't present a perfect TR, there's still some absolutism in there. Right. Because so, so much of this comes down to our attitude to our brothers and sisters right. that disagree. Even, even if we disagree about readings, like how do we treat them? What sort of disagreement is that? Right. Um, and if we, we treat it as a fundamental disagreement that ought to divide the body of Christ— then we're taking an absolutist perspective in practice, regardless of what concessions we might make at some point in our writing. Uh, and I think that's yeah. really, that really, that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah. So, so let's hop on our individual segues because we've come to the end of this session and ride them off into the next topic because that's a perfect segue. We need to key our belief to what God's word says. And there are verses, key verses that are brought up by textual absolutists 
that we need to understand and obey, to trust and obey. We're going to talk about those in the next session. Obviously, we don't believe they teach textual absolutism, but in fairness to our brothers who do, we need to talk through those. So come back, everybody, for the next session where we will get into the theology of, and that really does mean the exegesis behind, the verses behind textual absolutism. Thanks again, guys, for the discussion. Thank you for listening to the Textual Confidence Collective. You can find this podcast on Dr. Mark Ward's YouTube channel and anywhere else you find audio podcasts. Be sure to visit our website, www.textualconfidence.com. Thank you.